In this video, I'm going to be covering how we quantify radiation doses in radiation therapy. Physics textbooks will tell you the definition of absorbed dose to water, but they won't tell you much about what the actual concept of dose is supposed to achieve. At its core, dose is a quantity of medicine. Dose should also be related to the effect of that medicine. More dose should mean more effect, both more positive effects and more negative side effects. In theory, it could be anything that correlates with treatment outcomes, for example, milligrams of medication, although oral drug doses are a very imprecise measure of how much of a drug will actually reach the bloodstream. It's normally good enough for over-the-counter drugs, since the amount of drug reaching the place where it acts doesn't need to be terribly precise. If we can deliver a dose that we're confident will be well above the amount required to cause positive effects, and well below the amount required to cause toxicity, then it doesn't matter very much if the amount reaching the bloodstream is variable. But this isn't always the case. Patients on warfarin anticoagulant therapy walk a fine line between the prevention of blood clots that may cause stroke and excessive bleeding caused by inadequate blood coagulation. In this case, using the amount of oral medication as a measure of dose is not accurate enough to ensure a good treatment outcome. Instead, we use a more relevant measure, the INR, which is a direct measure of the blood's ability to clot. This allows us to more precisely tailor a patient's medication schedule in order to achieve the best treatment outcome. The outcomes of radiation treatments also vary a great deal with the amount of radiation used so we need a similarly accurate measure of dose. The quantity that we use could be anything that correlates with the outcomes, is also measurable and is reproducible as well. It defeats a lot of the purpose of working out how well one dose works on one group of patients if we can't give that same dosage again later on, or on other groups of patients as well. Research of treatment effectiveness is carried out all around the world. If we see that one group of patients does really well with a particular treatment, we might want the same result for our own patients. If we want the same results that we see in a published trial, we need to deliver the same treatment. This would be really difficult without a standard unit of dose. Without the gray, our unit of radiation dose, we couldn't say give 50 gray to this target, less than 20 gray to this organ. We just wouldn't have the language to describe it accurately. And it also wouldn't work if the 50 gray that the researchers deliver in their clinic is different from 50 gray that we deliver in our clinic. The gray needs to mean the same thing all around the world in order for us to reproduce each other's results. It needs to be standardized or we wouldn't be able to benefit properly from research performed around the world. We don't really know the relationship between radiation dose and the biological effects in much detail. We know generally speaking that if we deliver more dose we're more likely to sterilize a tumor and more likely to get side effects, but we don't really know at what rate these things vary with dose in humans. This is in large part due to the fact that it's not ethical to measure dose effect curves, because in order to do so we'd have to deliver a whole range of doses from very high to very low and look at the effects on people. That would involve overdosing some patients, resulting in nasty side effects, and underdosing some patients, resulting in treatment failure. It's ethical to try out different doses and delivery schedules if we expect them to deliver results that are equal to or better than the current standard of care, or if we have no idea yet what works, but doing something is preferable to doing nothing, as was the case when radiotherapy was first being pioneered 100 years or so ago. Dose effect curves are also likely to vary from patient to patient, different tumor types, and different treatment schedules as well. So even if we knew them in some circumstances, it would be difficult to determine if they apply to a given patient. Rather than knowing how treatment outcomes vary with dose, we measure these outcomes in very specific circumstances. For particular radiation doses, delivered according to particular schedules, aimed at particular diseases in particular groups of patients. If we want these same outcomes for our own patients, we need to be able to treat them with that same tested treatment protocol. We can only expect to see these same results if the definition of dose that we use in our clinic is the same as the one used by the people we're trying to copy. If we've changed our definition of dose, even by making it more accurate, we can expect to get a slightly different result to the one that we're going for. We might not know how different. As an example, let's look at warfarin therapy again. If treatments were initially prescribed using the mass of orally ingested medication as a measure of dose, we would have seen that the patient outcomes would have been extremely variable. Some patients would benefit, but a lot of them wouldn't. But we'd be able to work out over time what the optimum oral dose was. Using a direct measurement of the drug's effect on a patient's ability to form blood clots provides the ability to more precisely predict and control a patient's treatment outcome. It allows us to better tailor the treatment and get better results. But when making the initial switch from prescribing doses in terms of the mass of ingested medication to a measurement of the patient's blood clotting rate, we wouldn't yet know what value of the new measurement produces the best results. We need to do some more tests to work out which value of the clotting rate produces the best results. A radiotherapy relevant example of this would be the current move towards calculating dose to medium as opposed to dose to water in radiotherapy treatment planning. This stems from the fact that for many years our treatment planning systems were unable to account for differences in atomic composition in patient tissues when calculating doses. 
Many of them are now able to do so, providing more accurate calculations of radiation dose to patients, but the relationship between these doses and treatment outcomes may be altered. The accuracy of the quantity used to represent radiation doses evolved considerably. When we first started using x-rays and radium for medical purposes, we didn't know what photons were, what DNA was for, or even much about the structure of the atom. So options for specifying doses, that is, picking a quantity that we can measure that correlates with treatment outcomes, were pretty scarce. Early studies actually used the patient as a decimeter, since radiation was quantified using the skin erythema dose, that is, the amount of radiation required to make the skin go red. This suited the capabilities of the equipment available at the time, which could only deliver very low dose rates to very superficial lesions. The low dose rate meant that a patient's skin reaction would develop slowly over the course of a several day treatment. This allows the treatment to be stopped just before the skin reaction becomes intolerable. So a superficial lesion could be treated up to a maximum tolerable dose determined by the severity of a skin reaction. This may sound crude, but it's actually not a bad measure of radiation dose in this context, since it accounts for a patient's individual tolerance to radiation and isn't really affected by variability of radiation output of the machine. But this only works if a treatment is delivered very, very slowly. As X-ray tube technology improved, we could deliver higher dose rate treatments. This meant that a patient's skin reaction didn't evolve steadily as treatment was delivered. It became possible to deliver radiation very quickly and cause an intolerable skin reaction without realizing. Just like a pale person spending four hours out in the sun, they might think they're fine until a few hours later when they get home and realize that they're so sunburned they won't be able to move for a week. This meant that they needed a way to choose an appropriate radiation dose without being able to see a patient's skin reaction. They needed to be able to stop the treatment at the right time. There are a couple of different ways that this can be achieved. One is to leave a beam on for a specific amount of time, but the amount of radiation produced by an x-ray machine per second can vary quite heavily from machine to machine. So if two different x-ray machines, one emitting a larger amount of radiation per second, and one emitting a smaller amount of radiation per second, are used to irradiate a patient for the same amount of time, one patient will experience a greater treatment effect than the other, and each point inside the patient will also receive a different amount of radiation. If we wanted to remove the effect of the treatment unit dose rate on the treatment outcome, we could define treatment doses in terms of measurements of the amount of radiation leaving each machine per second. This allows us to prescribe doses in terms of the amount of radiation hitting a patient. So these two machines, even with different dose rates, if we tell them to deliver the same amount of radiation, the total amount that the patient gets no longer varies with the machine dose rate. But each point inside the patient will still receive a different amount of damage depending on its location. If we define the dose as the amount of radiation absorbed at each point inside the patient, we can prescribe treatments in terms of how much damage we want to do to various locations inside them. So any point inside the patient that receives the same amount of absorbed radiation will receive the same amount of damage. This allows us to account for varying radiation damage at different locations inside the patient. Although the effect of a particular absorbed dose is still variable, this is because the effect of a particular absorbed dose also depends on biological factors. For example, how well oxygenated a tissue is, how quickly its stem cells are dividing, and if its DNA repair mechanisms are intact, we could potentially get a better correlation of dose and effect if we knew a bit more about radiobiology. We may get to this point eventually, but for now we just don't know enough. At the moment, we use absorbed dose to water, which is defined in terms of joules per kilogram. It's the amount of energy absorbed per unit mass of material. We normally perform our absolute dose measurements in terms of gray in water because of convenience and the fact that it has similar radiation interaction properties to human soft tissue. What the two water part of absorbed dose to water actually means as opposed to dose to any other medium is a lot more confusing than it really needs to be. I'm going to cover it in more detail in a future tutorial, but suffice to say for now that it's a measurement of energy absorbed per unit mass of water measured in a water phantom. We use it as a surrogate for tissue damage, so more dose generally means more ionization in a tissue and therefore more damage. And as I said before, this allows us to determine dose inside a patient, independent of the machine that's used to deliver it and the geometry of the patient too. It's pretty obvious why we'd use energy as a measure of radiation dose, since more radiation energy deposited inside a tumor would mean more damage. But it's less obvious at first glance why we define dose as energy deposited per unit mass. This is because prescribing in terms of energy alone isn't very practical. If we were to prescribe in terms of energy deposited per tumor, the amount of actual damage caused by this energy would vary with the size of the tumor. A smaller tumor would have the energy concentrated into a smaller area, which would mean more damage per cell, and therefore a greater likelihood that all the cells within the tumor would be killed, whereas a tumor that was twice as large would have the same energy spread across twice the volume. Prescribing dose in terms of energy deposited per unit volume would account for this effect. It would also help us to account for the fact that energy deposited per tumor doesn't tell us where inside the tumor this energy is deposited. If we deliver 10 joules to a tumor, we know that the tumor as a whole gets 10 joules, 
but this energy could be deposited in a small part of the tumour, resulting in a low energy deposition in the rest of the tumour. And remember that in order to treat a cancer successfully, we need to destroy every dividing cell. So every part of the tumour needs to get a lethal dose. So a tumour irradiated with a distribution like this would almost certainly regrow and the treatment would fail. In order to get around this, we tend to divide the tumour up into lots of little volumes or points, which these days we get from a CT scan. The actual dose prescription is more along the lines of a minimum dose to the tumour. Each point or volume must receive above a certain amount of damage. We can do this if we use a unit of dose as defined in terms of volume or mass. But the reason that the grey is joules per kilogram and not joules per cubic centimetre is that the amount of energy absorbed by a small volume depends upon the density of material inside it. A volume containing material that's twice as dense has twice as many things for radiation to hit and will absorb roughly twice the amount of energy. I can't think of any reason why dose varying with density would be catastrophic, but we can and do minimise this effect by defining dose in terms of joules per kilogram. For example, this tumour with a density of 1 gram per cubic centimetre and a volume of 1 cubic centimetre absorbs an energy of 10 joules. The dose in terms of joules per gram will be 10 gray. If the tumour is exposed to the same amount of radiation but is twice as dense, with a density of 2 grams per cubic centimetre and absorbs 20 joules of energy as a result, the dose in terms of joules per gram will still be 10 gray. So we see that the dose does not depend on the density. So this definition of dose varies with the damage density inside a tumour, and therefore lack with the amount of cell death we can expect to see inside it. It doesn't vary with the size of the tumour volume, and it doesn't vary with density. Having a good treatment protocol to emulate, defined in terms of a good unit of dose, isn't that useful if you can't measure a grey or deliver one to your patients. There's also no point if your definition of the grey isn't the same as the one that you're trying to copy. A unit of measurement is only useful if, if everyone who's told how many of them to use gets pretty much the same result when they try. That means that a unit needs to be standardised. Imagine trying to give someone directions over the phone if you didn't know what a metre was and couldn't use landmarks. It wouldn't really be doable, you wouldn't have the language to do it. But having standardised units of measure like kilograms, metres and seconds allows us to give precise instructions. Standardising a unit is basically ensuring that we're all on the same page by comparing our own measuring tools to the same standard. For example, say that we wanted to standardise pant size in a world that didn't have any units of measurement. So we want anyone around the world to be able to walk into a clothing store and choose the correct size of pants off the rack. But since we don't have units of measurement, people can't just call each other up and say, make sure these pants are this wide. So in this situation, how would we make sure that all of the pants around the world are the same size? First, we need to choose a standard pair of pants. This could be any pair of the relevant size, say in this case size 32. If we have them in one country and want to make similar ones all around the world, what we could do is cut pieces of string to a length that matches the waist circumference. And we could say that this piece of string has been calibrated against the primary standard pair of pants and has become a secondary standard. We could mail secondary standards all around the world to various countries. They could use these pieces of string to ensure that their own size 32 pants are the same size as the primary standard. This pant size would be the same all around the world, so it has been standardized. Of course, a standard for pants wouldn't be much use for anything besides pants. If we standardize a unit of measurement instead that we can use to define the waist circumference of these pants, we could use it for a whole range of applications. And this is why we have the meter. Originally the meter was defined as one ten millionth of the distance between the equator and the North Pole. This wasn't really a practical definition, since it's difficult to go and measure that distance every time you want to draw lines on a ruler. The meter's been through a few different iterations since. For quite a while there was an actual meter which was a metal bar in France. But now it's the distance travelled by light in a vacuum in a small fraction of a second. This is standardised in the sense that a standards laboratory anywhere around the world can measure what a meter is, it will be the same no matter where it's measured, and they can use their measurement to calibrate secondary standards, i.e. draw lines on rulers, which can then be used to design pans of the correct size. The rulers that you buy from your local stationery store probably haven't been calibrated against a primary standard like a speed of light measurement, but they will be traceable back to one of these, in that they might have been compared with something that's been compared with something that's been compared with something that's been compared with the primary standard. Multiple generations of comparison may result in slightly less accurate measuring devices, but they should all give pretty much the same result. Since every pants factory around the world should have access to rulers, you don't need to send them a secondary pants standard. You can just ask them, please make the waist circumference 32 inches or 81 centimeters, and they can pull out their rulers and do it. In order to standardize the gray, we need to do something similar to the two examples I've just discussed. Essentially what we need to do is to get something that's equivalent to those pieces of string or those rulers that would allow us to measure out the grey to every single radiotherapy treatment centre in the world, and they all need to give the same results. We start once again by defining a standard. Given that the grey is a unit of energy deposition, we can't really keep it in a glass case and roll it out when we want to compare it with something, 
like when we're calibrating a measurement instrument, like what we currently do with a kilogram, which is still actually a lump of metal that lives in a vault in France. So what we do instead is measure it precisely as one joule per kilogram in terms of standard quantities like mass, temperature, electrical current, time, and distance. Primary standards to symmetry laboratories have equipment that can measure the gray in terms of standard units of these quantities, meaning that we can use different methods of measurement to combine these basic units in different ways. Different labs use different measurement methods that rely on different quantities. The Australian Standards Lab measures the gray using calorimetry, meaning that they use the measured temperature change of a mass of irradiated material in order to measure the energy absorbed per unit mass. Some other standards labs use a cavity ionization chamber. They measure the amount of charge produced by radiation in a known mass of air and relate this to the energy absorbed per unit mass of air. Chemical dissymmetry is also used, but I have no idea how that works. Even though some standards labs use different methods to determine the gray, all of the measurements are performed using standardized units, which are the same all around the world, so when measurements of the gray are compared between these labs, which they frequently are, the results are very similar. So within the margins of measurement uncertainty, labs using these processes produce the same value of the gray all around the world. In the actual hospitals themselves, performing measurements of this many quantities with this sort of precision isn't practical. So what we do instead is something similar to the method of pants calibration that I discussed on the earlier slide. We send our local standard, which is an ionization chamber that's only able to measure charge, to a standards lab. The standards lab will measure out a known dose of radiation in terms of gray and compare the number of gray delivered with the measured charge. This ratio of gray per measured charge is called a calibration factor. It can be used in the hospitals to obtain measurements in terms of gray. We use a calibration factor in conjunction with a dissymmetry protocol like TRS-398 in order to obtain these measurements. The code of practice allows us to apply a calibration factor determined in a particular beam at the standards lab to our own potentially vastly different clinical beams. Every treatment center should have an ionization chamber with a calibration factor that's traceable to a primary standards dissymmetry laboratory. Because these chambers are calibrated at standards labs that produce the same value of gray around the world, we should all be able to obtain the same value of the gray in our own clinics as well.